So bottom line, Shochel Le Bnei Glila Le Rabbi Chelbo. So Bnei Glila sent to Rabbi Chelbo. Acharei and me. So we said Cohen and Levi go first. That we're not arguing about. Nun Tesem Abayz. They just went to the top of Samach Hamad Aleph. After the Cohen and Levi, so who comes next? Me Korin. That means is there any is there any list to the Yisrael? Is there any rules to the Yisrael? Now we know we have all these lists in general. Who we give? Rismila. That's not what it's talking about. It's in general. Is there a partial list on a Shabbos? Because on a weekday it's only one aliyah. On the Shabbos, when you have the Yisrael, so there's more than one. So how do you figure out who to give it to? Lo hava He didn't know. Asa v'shayi lo rabbi yitzchok nafcha amar leacharein kar and tamel chacham amulin parnas and alat tzibor. The first person I guess only is a tamel chacham who is appointed as a parnas on the tzibor. What does that mean? Rashi tells us somebody that you can ask him a dvar halacha bechol omra bechol makom veomra. You ask him a dvar halacha anywhere in in the world, anywhere in shas. And uh, he can tell you that. That's very impressive. Then we know, of course, there's numerous people who could tell you all the halachas everywhere in the, in, uh, in the Torah and in Poskim. Um, unfortunately, we can't appoint all of them to be the rabbis. And therefore, the ones who are roy but not actually appointed, they're fit but not actually appointed, they get the next aliyah. Then you get the kids of those that know all of the halachas because after all it's covered for their father for them to get an aliyah. Then you get the gabayim. You get all the people that do all the work in the shul. Then you get the pashriyid. Can we read chumashim in the What's a chumash? So Chumash is not the art scroll. A Chumash is that they used to write the five different Chumashin. They used to write them as a Sefer Torah, but it was more like a Megillah. So it would have Megillah's Bereshis, Megillah's Shmos, Megillah's Vayikra, Megillah's Bamidbar, Megillah's Dvar. We had five different of them. Like we have today, if you see sometimes, I think the Kolal actually has, they have the different Nevi'im. In, uh, they have the, the different Nevi'im that they read from for Torah. We have also in the Shul. We don't use them, though. Do we always use them? Yeah. We no, use no. them. No, no. We, we don't use them like on a regular uh, fast day or anything like that. So maybe we should. Okay. You can be the uh, Rosh Knesios, and then you can get an Aliyah. Fine. So, What about if we want to read, like this week's Parsha, we want to take out the Shmos one? We just want to read the Shmos, and we don't want to carry the heavy Sefer Torah to the Bima. We want to just read the Shmos one. Lo have a He didn't know. He didn't know either. So clearly, they're not Parnasim uh, uh, Alat But they didn't know. We know that if a Sefer Torah is missing even one section, so then if it's missing one section of parchment, then you don't then you don't read from it. So if a whole Sefer Torah is missing just one section, you're not going to read from it. For sure, if you have just one section of the Torah, you have just Shmos, you're not going to read from it. Says the Gemara of Elohi, no, that's not a good argument. Hasam mechser b'milse, because maybe if it has most of it, but it's missing one piece, one urea, that won't be good because you're missing something. Hachalom mechser milse, but here, if the entire thing is here, and it just happens to be the entire Shmos, and not the entire Torah, but you have an entire unit of what you're looking for, and therefore maybe it would in fact be good. Rabbi of Yosef Dhamar Tavayu and Karim Biv Khumash and Basin Nessa. No, there's a separate reason, not because it's not full, but because of Kavod Sibor. Mishum Kavod Sibor. It's not Kavod Sibor. Why is it not Kavod Sibor? Seemingly because it's just not nice that we're not going to read out of a regular Sefer Torah in the Tibor. And therefore, Mishum Kavod Sibor, not because it's Mech Samilse. Obviously, it's connected, but not just because it's missing thing, but it's not Kavod Sibor to read out of a Khumash Biv Basin Nessa. For Rabbi of Yosef Dhamar Tavayu, Hai Sefer Aftarta, the Sefer Haftorah, you can't read from the Sefer Torah on Shabbos. Why not? Seemingly, the Sefer Torah wasn't just like we're talking about the entire Navi. The Sefer Torah was just that it just wrote that week's Haftorah on a piece of parchment. Why not? My time. Or it just had a parchment with all the different Sifrei, all of the different, like we have Haftorah books. It had a parchment with like all the Haftorahs in it. That's not proper to read. My time. So you can't have the Sefer Haftorah because it's not, ri- it's not, it's not meant to be written down. That's very interesting. What does it mean? It's not written. It's 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 not meant to be written down, because you're not meant, as Rashi says, pachos mi sefer echad shalim latzmo. It's not right to write down less than one whole sefer. Again, we had a question of the Chumashin because it was one of the five books of Moses. Over here, it seems like the Tumar would not have a problem if you took out an entire Navi Yeshaya. 
The problem is if you only write the piece of the Avtori that you need in Yeshaya, and then you want to take that out, so that's lo nitan li kasev, because it's less than one whole sefer. Mabra Ravashi Amar Letiltule Nam Yasser, and since you can't go ahead and you shouldn't be writing just that week's Haftar on a parchment. Therefore, you can't move it either. My time at Halachazi Lemikrebe, since it's not fit to be written, it's therefore Muksa. For Lohi, it's not true. Shari Latutle Vishari Lemikrebe. And the Gemara says, no, it's not true. You're actually allowed to use it. And therefore, since you can use it, you can move it as well. Where do we know that you can use a haftorah that's written on a parchment only that week's haftorah, not a full sefer? Where do we know that that's good and therefore it's not moksa? Because we see the Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish would go and they would learn in the sifra agadita on Shabbos. The halo nita and likasev, just like you said that it's not right to go ahead and to write down less than a full sefer. Therefore, you shouldn't be able to write down the haftorah. We said no. Nevertheless, you can write down the haftorah because we see that even though things that aren't necessarily supposed to be written down, we let them. Write down. Why? Where do we see you're not supposed to write it down? Because we know that the Sifri Agadita, which is seemingly the Gemara, the Allah, the Agadita, you're not supposed to write that down. Why not? Because that's Torah Sheb Al Peh. Says Gemara, Ela Kevan de Loef Shar Eis La Sos Hashem Heferu Torah Techa, Hachanami Kevan de Loef Shar Eis La Sos Hashem Heferu Sarasacha. Right? We know in general, we're going to discuss that a little bit today. In general, the rule was that we shouldn't write down the oral law. The oral law is supposed to be as it says, oral. Problem was that Lamai said we couldn't remember everything, Yidiyidas Hadairos, and therefore Eis La Sos Hashem. Once the time, as Rashi says, in Ba'es Lasos Takana Lashem Shamayim. If it's the time Lasos Lashem Shamayim Lashem, Heferu Divre Torah Lashah Hatzricha. Right? That says sometimes, that comes up sometimes from time to time. Eis Lasos Shem Heferu Torah Techa. We have a halacha, but we have to get rid of the halacha. We have to ignore the halacha in this case, because the Mice said, What do you want us to do? We have no choice. We're doing it Lashem Shamayim. We're doing it for the sake of heaven. And we have no choice, because if we don't write down the oral law, even though we're not supposed to, we're going to forget it. So just like over there, they let them write down the oral law, they let them write down the Sifra. Agata, and once they let them write down the Sifra Agata because people are going to forget it, then the Sifra Agata doesn't become books on Shabbos and therefore you can move it. So too it sounds like Eis La Sos La Shem Torah as Rashi explains, that every single shul can't afford to have the full Navi. And since you can't afford to have the full Navi, even though it's not quote-unquote Mitzat Hadin, Me'ikar Hadin, it's not the proper thing to just write down that week's Haftorah on a parchment, and to just have all of the Haftorahs on a parchment, like a Haftorah book is not proper. Right? You'll actually notice this, even not on a parchment, you know that today there's different opinions. There are some shuls, I believe here as well, where they have the entire Tanakh. There are some, there's a safe, there's like a safe after I grew up with like a book of, of all the Haftorahs. That's what many people use. That would be a little bit connected. This is talking about on a parchment, that would be a little bit connected. You have many shuls that Dafka use a whole Tanakh and they pick out the parts and they just go to that week's leaning in the Tanakh. That would be a similar discussion here. Again, not the same because they're talking about writing on parchment here, but over there, that would be the Machlokas. If a Haftorah book is, is enough, or whether you really use as many hold, you should be using the entire Tanakh and you just go ahead and you pick the place that you want because it's much better to have the entire Tanakh and to read from it. But over here, for our purposes here, the point was that they couldn't write the entire Navi on a parchment. And therefore, since they couldn't afford it, so the Shem Shemaim, they said, even though in general we don't write parts of Svarim, the Shem Shemaim, we could write just this week's Haftorah on a piece of parchment and use that, even though the Chachila, the best thing would be to have the entire Navi on a parchment. And nowadays they even have the individual Haftorahs for each Shabbos in separate books. <coughs> Is that... I, do. I never saw that. Yeah. In a separate booklet? Yeah. Uh huh. As long as they get the right booklet. Again, it's not a problem. It's okay to use this, but it's saying, Lechachila, seemingly, it would be best to use the entire thing. That's why they actually, um, during, uh, what do they do? They make a special no, don't they, no, when, when, when you use an actual cloth, it's, it's a different bracha. bracha. You make the bracha, yeah. Fine. So that's the story over there. That's on uh, the Megillus. That's by the Megillus, I'm sorry. That's by like Megillus Eicha and Rosh and Shirait. Let's say you want to write a Megillah. You want to write uh, Parsha. You want the kid to learn Parsha as Bracious. So you want to write Bracious on a, uh, you want to write Bracious on a parchment. So you want to write it so that he can learn. So there's a question depending on who you learn. Either way, however you learn, so you're going to have a question. What's the two opinions? One opinion is that Megillah, Megillah, Nitna. What does that mean? That Moshe would be told the Parsha, and he would write down. He basically kept a running diary. 
kept a running diary, and at the end of the 40 years, he took all of the stuff that he had written throughout the 40 years in the desert from the time of Matan Torah all the way until the time that he passes away, except for the last day took him, and he compiled them all and he just basically bound them together. Or there's another opinion, that's Megillah, Megillah, Nidma. As it happened, it was quote unquote given and written down. Tibai Laman Damar Torah Hasuma Nidma. Or, obviously Moshe was a smart person, or we could say at the end of the 40 years, so then he went down and he wrote everything. He knew, he remembered everything by heart over the last 40 years. I can't remember what I did yesterday. He remembered the entire 40 years by heart. And at the end of the 40 years, he goes and he wrote down the entire Torah. So no matter how you learn, it's still a question whether you can write a Megillah for a Tino. Why? Tibai Laman Damar Torah Megillah, Megillah, Nidma. Uh, if you say that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote down pieces and pieces at each time, came unto Megillah, Megillah, Nitna, Kosvin. So maybe since he wrote down pieces at each time, so too it would be okay to write down for a kid a piece at a time because of Misa, even though you only want one piece. Since when Moshe wrote it, he wrote it piece by piece by piece by piece by piece. Therefore, if I want to write one piece for a kid, that would be okay. Or on the same token, you can write, you can use the other side of the story. Again, this is within the Mount Dharma, it says that Moshe wrote down time by time, piece by piece. Odilma cave unto Idbak Idbak. No, maybe by Moshe it was okay because ultimately it was going to be bound together at the end. Over here, you have no intention to write the whole Torah and bind it together. You only have intention to write this one piece, and therefore it might not be good. Tibai Laman Dharma Torah Hasumanina. Now, if you go to the other opinion, and Moshe wrote the entire thing at the end of 40. So obviously the Pashup Shah would be that here you can't do it. Kevin de Chasuma Nidna ain't Kosvin. Odilma Kevin de Loevshar Kasvinan. Or maybe since it's not possible, then you can't go ahead and write it. So what does that mean, Kevin de Loevshar? Seemingly, since you can't go ahead and Rashi. She ain't called Sibor. No, that's not here. Um, so what does this mean, Kevan de lo Efshar, that this guy can't necessarily afford to do it, or that Lamaisa, this guy, we only we're not going to write the whole thing for him. He's saying that uh, yeah, since it's not practical to write, it's not practical to write an entire Torah for every kid who wants to learn. Then you can write. Right. So over there, they needed to write the entire Torah. So you want to say, okay, so just like over there, they wrote the entire Torah over here. If you don't write the entire Torah, it's not okay. Kevan de lo Efshar, it's not practical, right? They can't afford it. It's pra- practical, same as far as the Navi. It's not practical to go ahead and write an individual. Torah. It's a nice idea, but it's not practical for every kid that comes into first grade. Instead of getting a Chumash at the Chumash play, to get an entire Torah at the Chumash play, that's not practical, and therefore we can give each kid his own Parsha, Kasvinan. So Amar Lai, so he answers, so you have a man de Amar, so no matter how you learn, you can learn both ways. So there's four ways to learn, two pro and two against a Megillah being written for a kid to learn from. Amar Lai ain't Kosvin. So he says you can't write one Parsha on a parchment for a kid. Umatam, what's the reason? Good reason. Lafisha ain't Kosvin. Because you can't write it. You ask me the reason? Because I said so. Lafisha ain't Kosvin. Well, really, it's the way the Rashi explains whichever Sfari you want. Liman to Amr, that the, each one was written individually. You can't write it because Lamai said those were all bound up together at the end. And the one who wrote that, Moshe Rabbeinu wrote the entire thing at the end. So then the reason you can't write it for this kid is because Lamai said Moshe Rabbeinu wrote the entire thing. He didn't write Megillah, Megillah. Ace you have a case over here where we're going to bring a bryce with Hilni Hamalka. Afi Asta Tabla Shalzov Shaparsha Sota Ksuva Love. We know that in the base of Migdash, so when a Sota would come, so they would go ahead and they would copy the Parsha of the Sota onto the parchment and they would mix it, etc. And they tried to prevent the erasing of God's name and they would mix it. But what did they do? They would actually copy the words from the Torah. So what were the options over here? Either you can take an entire Torah every time, right? How does a Sofa write a Torah? When a Sofa writes a Torah, nowadays he has a copy. He doesn't have an actual Torah, but back in the day they would take a Torah and they would copy from that Torah into the new Torah. Now they have copies and everything. So what were the options when you needed to write the Parsha Sasota, when a Sota came for you and by the base of Migdash, what were the options for the Sofer? Either the Sofer could take out a Sefer Torah every single time and copy the Parsha Sasota onto a new parchment for this specific lady, or they can have a photocopy. So she decided instead of taking out the Torah every time, what's she going to do? She's going to go ahead and she's going to have a golden, she's going to have a golden tablet where they're going to copy the Parsha of the Sota on so that they wouldn't have to pull out a whole Sefer Torah every single time. What do you see from here? So you see from here that seemingly you can write one piece of the Torah separately because she's writing just the Parsha of the Sota on this Tabla Shazav. So we should be able to. You just told me you can't write a Parsha, one Parsha for the kid. You see over here that Hilia Malka wrote the Parsha of the Sota specifically in the base of Migdash and it was just the Parsha of the Sota. Yeah, it was on a Tabla versus Parchment so for sure you should be able to write a Parsha on the, on, on the Parchment no. She didn't write the entire parsha of Sota. She actually wrote it with olive base. What does that mean with olive base? She would wrote she she wrote the um she wrote just uh like shorthand. She would just write Rashi Tevos. 
she would write, uh, as we see over here, im shachav, im lo shachav, she would write aleph shin, aleph lamed shin. And everybody would know what it means. So therefore, over there, it's okay to write, you can write parshas if you write them in shorthand, if you write Rashi Tevos. Obviously, for a kid, you're not going to write Rashi Tevos. He's learning how to read Chumash for the first time. Ace so now we have a Shiloh that she wrote Rashi Tevos. How do we know she wrote Rashi Tevos? It says Kishahu Kosev. We know that it's not possible to suggest that she wrote Rashi Tevos because it says Kishahu Kosev when the Kohen Gadol, or when the Kohen would, when the Sofer would write the Parsha of Sota, Roev Kosev Masha Kosu Bitabla. He would write exactly what it says in the Tabla. Obviously, when he's writing the Parsha of Sota, it needs to be word for word what it says in the Torah. It can't be the Rashi Tevos. So how could it be if it says that he copied directly from the Tabla? It must be that the Tabla had the entire Parsha of Sota. Ema Kimasha Kosu Bitabla. No, he didn't actually copy word for word. He knew based on the Rashi Tevos, but he wrote the entire Parsha. That was okay in that specific situation because God said so. But she on the Tabla had only had the Rashi Tevos. Ace Kishu Kosev Ra Betabla. So what's written in the tabla? That's the psukim by Sota. So you see over here that it actually didn't write Rashi Tevas on the tabla. It wrote the actual psukim. And if he wrote and he copied directly from the tabla, and on the tabla it wrote the entire psukim, then it must be that he only wrote the entire parsha on the tabla. If he only wrote the entire parsha on the tabla, it shows that you can write separate parshio, separate parshio, separate parshios, and therefore we should be able to write for the kid who wants to have a parsha. Says the Gemara, Hacha b'mayaskinan b'seirugin. No, over here we are dealing with seirugin. What does that mean, b'seirugin? That means it was sort of like a combination. B'seirugin is that, as Rashi says, Tchilas hamikra yakasav teva shleima uluvasov Rashi tevos. No, Yomaz got me, but I got you. He says you're right. In the first part of the line, we would write a whole word. Then the rest of the line would be Rashi tevos. So the first part of the line, when it says im shachav, so im shachav, and then the rest of that line would be Rashi tevos. Im lo shachav, then the rest of it would be Rashi tevos. So it's okay that he'll need. Did it because she was writing in Rashi Tevo. It was a combination of full words in Rashi Tevos. But if you want to write an entire Megillah, an entire um, Sefer and Chumash, you want to write an entire Parsha for a kid, that would not be okay. Unless, of course, you wrote it in Rashi Tevos, which wouldn't necessarily help you at all. Kitanai. Now we're going back to Abayi's question. Abayi's question was Lemaise. Because now we said you can write it or you can't write it. So Lemaise, can you write a Megillah for a Tinoch for them to learn from? Ain't Kosen Megillah Latinoch Lislamid Ba. Vim Dait Olahashlim Mutter. Ah. But if you write for him Parshas Gracious, and you ultimately plan on writing Parshas Noach next time, and Parshas Lechacha afterwards, and then you're going to bind them all together so you can write one at a time and let him learn the one that you write, but as long as you have a plan to write all of them eventually. Rabbi Yehuda Mer, no. Rabbi Yehuda says, Bebreshes Ador HaMabul, Betores Kohanim, Ad Vayihi Bayom Hashmini. He seems to say that as long as you write pieces at a time. As long as you just write full topics at a time, it's okay. You don't have to have the intention, seemingly, according to Yehuda, to finish Lahashlam. According to Tanakama, you have to have the intention to eventually write the entire Torah. According to Yehuda, it sounds like you don't have to have the intention, and seemingly, Rabbi Yehuda would say that you can, in fact, write topics, and therefore, for sure, seemingly, Rabbi Yehuda would say you can write Parsha, Parsha, and therefore, if I asked you, Kitanai, so the question, the question that Abai asked, can you write a Megillah for Tino Klizam, but can you write one Parsha, Parsha with gracious? So the answer, according to Tanakama, would be you can do that as long as you have the intention intention to ultimately write the other parts of the Torah, the other parshas in the Torah as well, and then to bind them all together. And Rabbi Yudah says, as long as you would write an entire parsha, as long as you would write an entire topic, so then in fact it would be okay to do. Am Rabbi Yochanan Bishum, Rabbi Bina. Torah, Megillah, Megillah, Nidna. So he's poskening that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote it down as it happened. Shanamar Azamarti Hine Bati B'Megillah's Sefer Kosov this is David Hamela saying that there was a Megillah Sefer, and as Rashi explains, he's talking about that Shtei Otechan himself. He talks about the fact that he's okay, that he came that he came from Rus from Rus Hamoavia, and this was the parsha where it says to Lot that Shtei Otechan himself, where Lot will be saved in the merit of the fact that David Hamela will eventually come from him. So he says, "Be Megillah Sefer Kasevalai." We see that he's written that he calls Megillah Sefer being gracious. He calls Megillah Avraham Kasevalai. He calls that Megillah, and therefore you see that if he's calling Bracious a Megillah, it's clear that each part, or not even Bracious, that story of Lodi, he's calling a Megillah, it's clear that each part, according to this opinion, it's clear that each part of the Torah was given, Megillah, Megillah, Nidna, and Moshe wrote them out as he got them. Reish Lakish Omer, Torah Chasuma Nidna, no. That Moshe remembered the whole 40 years, and at the end of the 40 years, he wrote the entire diary. Shanamar, as it says, Lakoach has Sefer HaTorah Hazos. 
It doesn't call it Megillah. It calls it the entire Sefer Torah. Yeah, but what about the opinion now who holds that it was given individually? It was written down piece by piece by piece. Lamais, it says the entire Sefer Torah. Who Labasa did? No, that's referring to after each piece was bound together, then it's called an entire Sefer Torah. But in Achlami, it was written piece by piece. According to the opinion that it was all given together, it was all written together. So Lamais said, what is Davin Amalek referring to when he says that the part in Bereshis, which talks about Lot, that's a Megillah. Why is that a Megillah? Lamais said, according to the way you're learning, the entire thing was written at the end of the 40 years. Hahu de kola Torah, kula ikre Megillah. He's saying, no, when it calls that a Megillah, it's referring to the entire Torah. And the entire Torah, in fact, is called a Megillah. Dechsev ayomer elai. Ma taroeh, va omer ani roeh megillah afa. We see that the entire Torah is called the Megillah, and therefore, no matter how you learn, you can learn these psukim. And again, there is a machlokas: was the entire Torah written down at once at the end of the forty years, or did Moshe Rabbeinu megillah megillah nina? Did he write it down as time went on? Inami, or you can say again: this is within the opinion who holds that the entire thing was written down at once. Therefore, what does the Pasuk refer to when it says Megillah? So the first answer is that Megillah refers to the entire Torah. Another possibility, if you hold that the Torah was written down at the end of 40 years, so then what does it mean when David Amel says, Megillah, Sefer, Kosovo, Lai, Inami, Likid, Rebbe, Levi? Or it could be Likid, Rebbe, Levi. What does it mean? To Amr, Levi, the whole thing was written down, but I agree, there were still parts of the Torah called Megillah. Why? Because even the opinion that holds, according to Rebbe, Levi, even the opinion that holds that Moshe Rabbeinu didn't write it down piece by piece by piece, he wrote the entire thing down at the end of 40 years, even that opinion says Rabbi Levi agrees that throughout the 40 years, eight parshios he wrote down on the day that they were Hukam Mishkan. That means if you hold Megillah, Megil, and he wrote it down day by day by day by day by day, he kept a running diary. According to the other opinion, he wrote down it all at the end of the 40 years. Says Rabbi Levi, even if you hold that he wrote down the entire thing at the end of the 40 years, I still agree that there are eight parshios in the Torah that he wrote down on the day of the Hukam Mishkan, besides for what he wrote. And then he filled in everything else at the end of the 40 years. What were the eight parshios that were written on the day of Hukam Mishkan? Seemingly, eight parashiots that were connected to the building of the Mishkan. What were the eight parashiots connected to the building of the Mishkan? Shmona Prakim Shmona Parashiots and Emre Biyom Shehukam Boa Mishkan Elohein Parashas Kawanim the parsha of the Kohanim, and more Kohanim, and Aaron, and Amartol, Lehem, Lenefesh, Lo Yitama, Be'amav, and Amum, etc., etc., because they needed to know about the Avoda. Uparsha, Slevi'im, right? That the Levi'im, the Bahalos, as it says, that they have to go ahead and they have to do the Shira, as Rashi says. Uparshas Tamei, and we have to know all of the people that are going to be Tamei for Hilchos Pesach, and we said that the Mishkan was put up when, says Rashi, on the first of Nisan, and therefore we have to go in and we have to know all these din of Tuma and Tara, first of all, in terms of coming to the Mishkan and because of the Korban Pesach. Uparshas Shiluach Tameim, and the parsha, what do you do when somebody's Tamei? You've got to send them out of the Machana. Uparshas Acharemos, Parshas Acharemos, that was for Yom Kippur. Why would he tell them that on the day of the Hukam of Mishkan? Because Acharemos, Shnei B'nei Aaron, that happened on the day that the Mishkan was put up. The two sons of Aaron had died, not of an avio. So that parsha was written that day. Flip the page. Uparsha Stue Yayin. We also had to write on the day of the Hukam of Mishkan, we had to write the parsha of the Khanim getting drunk, because that's applicable for the Mishkan as well. Uparsha Neros had to light the menorah. Uparsha Paraduma and the parsha of Parazaduma, because on the next day they burnt the Paraduma so that they would be kosher for the Korban Pesach. Omar Rabbi Elazar. Torah Rov Bichsav. Umiut al peh. So the Torah is mostly bichsav and a little bit of it is be'al peh. Rav Shechter quotes this as saying that, what does that mean? He uses this to understand a little bit differently, but he says, what does that mean? We know that if you look at a library today, you have millions and millions of sfarim that are Torah Shabal peh, and you only have the five books of Moses. You have the Tanakh. So that's not what it means here. Amr Belazar, Torah rov bichsav umiyut al peh, shenemar echto lo rubi torasi kemozar nechshivu. So rov bichsav means, as Rashi says, if you look on the left side, rov ha Torah tluya bimedrish, seksuva lemedrish beklalu that means most of the Torah depends on the 13 Midosh Torah Nidrash Espahen. Most of the Torah needs a Medrash, right? If you go ahead and you learn Torah and you just learn the Pashab Shat, so then you're not going to be able to get anything out of it. So most of the Torah is depending on the 13 Midosh Torah Nidrash Espahen, as opposed to what? Miyuta Bial Peh seemingly is just what was told to Moshe Rabbeinu. He doesn't necessarily say this, but for, for easy, uh, for easy uh, understanding, well, let's just say the Allah Chala Moshe Misinais. So you have most of the Torah is learned from the Shlosha Esri Midos and all the other Midos Torah and Yedrash Behen, and a small part of the Torah is what God told to Moshe and says, this is the Allah, 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 even if you don't understand it, even if it doesn't make sense to you, these are the Allah, 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 Allah
klal luprat zera shav etc. The midas shatorin judgment and a small amount are the lach al moshe mitzina shenamar echdo lo rubi tarasi kmozar nechshivu. For Rav Yochanan Mar Rov Alpeu miut bechsav. So he argues and he says that no, most of it is Baalpeh, most of them are lach al moshe mitzinais and some of it is bechsav. Now this is actually hard to understand and the rishonim deal with this, but it seems like there's a lot more laws from the Torah and midosh and midosh and Torah and drasha behind than they are from halach al moshe. It's a little bit hard to understand exactly where Rabbi Yochanan means here. He quotes the pasuk Shnamar ki al piad var ma'ela, but lemaisa it seems like Rabbi Lazar is correct that the Torah rov bichsav umiud al peh. The idach nami haksev echto lo rubi terasi, but it says over here echto lo rubi terasi. It says that most of it is Torah she bichsav. So what's Rabbi Yochanan going to say to that? Hahu it mu may come it must. Says Rabbi Yochanan who holds that most of it is Torah she al peh. He says no, that's not a proof. That's a question. Hashem is saying echto lo rubi terasi alo kamar zer nechshavu. You want me to write down the entire Torah, even the parts that I wrote down has already been for. Forsaken. How do you expect me to write down the entire Torah? The Idach and the one who holds, Rabbi Lazar holds that most of it is Torah Shabbatsa, most of it is the Torah Midrash, is, is the uh, rule Shah Torah Midrash behind. What does it mean when it says, Ki Alpi Advarma Ela, Hahu Mishum de Takife Limig Mirinhu? That means not that it's greater in number. When it says Ki Alpi Advarma Ela, it just means that the Torah Shabbatsa is more difficult than the Torah Shabbatsa. But doesn't mean that Alpi Advarma Ela, that there's more Torah. There's not more halachal moshe misinais. If you want to use the Torah shabbat as being halachal moshe misinais, it's just that the halachal moshe misinais are much more difficult to understand. Next up topic: Darash Rabbi Yehuda Bar Nachmeni Miturgamane de Rabbi Shimon Ben Lakish Ksiv. It says in the Torah Ksiv Lacha Es Hadvar Ma'ela. It says you should write down these words Uchsiv Ki Al Pi Hadvar Ma'ela, and it also writes because of these things Hakatzad. What's the story? How do you understand both of them? One of them is Shebech Sav, and one of them is Torah Sheba Alpeh, as we just mentioned. Devarim Shebech Sav, Yata Rasha El Omar Alpeh. This is the famous concept. Things that are supposed to be written in the actual Torah, you can't say them by heart. This idea of not actually learning Torah by heart. The scripture. Devarim Sheba Alpeh, Yata Rasha El Omar Alpeh. And the stuff that's supposed to be oral needs to stay oral. So the stuff that needs to be written down needs to be written down and can't be done by Alpeh. And the stuff that needs to be by Alpeh needs to stay by Alpeh and can't be written down. The baby Rishmael Tana Ela, Ela Ata Kosev. Only the Torah you should write down. Viyata Kosev Alachos. Don't write down the oral law. Am Rabbi Yochanan. Similar Rabbi Yochanan says Lokar Sekodesh Baruch Hu Brisim Yisrael Abishvil Dvarim Shabi Alpeh. Really, the real Bris is because of the oral law. Shnemar Ki Alpeh Dvarim Ela Karasi Itcha Bris the Es Yisrael. But again, obviously we know Eitz Lasos Hashem a favorite Torah Tacha. And even though Lechatchila we would want all of the laws to not be written down, we would want the Torah to be written down and the oral laws. To be to stay oral, since we would not be able to do so, and we, it's even hard enough for you to do so when everything's written down. We would not be able to learn if everything was oral, so therefore we had no choice but to write down even the oral law. So we go ahead and we keep the air of chatseros right when you have an, when you have a. Uh, bunch of different houses. Even if you have a wall around you, you need an Erev Chatzeros to put all of the houses together. So Shalom. So we have to make the Erev and you leave the Erev in the house that it was in because of Dark Shalom. What's the Dark Shalom? That you have to leave the Erev in the house. You can't move the Erev from one house to another house. I want the Erev in my house this week. My time. Oh, what's the problem? If you say it's not covered for the people that are going to be getting the Erev, it is covered. We know that there was a shofar that they used to blow, like in Eretz Yisrael now, and they have the shofar, they have the big siren before uh, Shabbos, they used to have a shofar that they would blow in this town before Shabbos. And it originally was in the Bay Rav Yehuda. When he died it went to Lulubasof Bay Rav, Lulubasof Bay Rav Yosef, Lulubasof Bay Abay, Lulubasof Bay Rav It went from house to house to house. So it can't be that switching the era from house to house to house is going to be a pegam and kavod. It's actually a kavod for you to have it. So what's the problem that we can't move the era from house to house to house? Says the Gemara, Ela Mishum Chashada. It's because of Chashada. What does it mean Chashada? Well, if I came to your house last week and you had the era in your house and now I come back for Shabbos again this weekend, you don't have the Erev in your house, so I'm going to think what? I'm going to think that all of a sudden you don't care about an Erev anymore, you threw out the Erev and you don't care. So it's really not, it really it would be a cover for everybody to have it in their house for one Shabbos at a time. But because of the person who had it originally, if we would take it away from him, then people will start being choshed, he doesn't really care about an Erev, that he threw it out, even though we know that we gave it to somebody else's house. Therefore, once it's in your house, it stays in your house. Bor Shehu Karav La'ama So this is when you had an irrigation channel, and you had a bore, you had a cistern, whichever one was closest to the irrigation channel would be able to fill up their cistern first. Itmar b'nei nahara. So b'nei nahara says, Rav, Rav Amar, 
Tati Shasumaya Beresha, right? Let's say you have a river, and the river is going downstream. So you have on the top, you have a boar, you have somebody that has fields that has a cistern on top, then you have somebody that has a cisterns on the bottom. So naturally, the water would go downstream and it would go to the person on top. If he makes the water come to him, he can make the water come to him, or else it will just continue to flow down to the people on the bottom. So Rav says that the bottom one, downstream, gets the water first, because that's the natural flow of the water. Shmuel says no, the one upstream can get the water first. When the water is flowing naturally, so then it's anybody who wants to take and take. That means you have a river that's flowing. You want to open up your thing to go ahead and get some water into your bore. That's okay. Open up your bore. Let the water flow into your bore and then let the rest of the water flow down. Then the guy on the bottom will get no problem. What's this talking about? This is talking about damming the river. That means if you dam the river, so now all of a sudden all the water will come to your fields. So the question is when you have a river that's going downstream and you have fields on the top of the river and fields on the bottom, who gets the first right to the water? That means who can dam the river first? Can the guy on top dam the river and stop all the water from going down and let it come to his field first and then let it go down? Or does he not have the right and really has to let the water flow down and go to the guy on the bottom first? Shmuel says the guy on top can dam the river because the mice he's closer to the source of the water and therefore since he's closer to the source he could dam it, he could let the water come to him first and then whatever's left can go down to the guy on the bottom and Rav argues and says you might be closer to the source but you can't physically do anything to stop the water from flowing to me and since the natural flow of water is going to come downstream to me first you can physically go and make a dam in order to quote unquote steal the water and have the water come to you first Tnan. Now we have another Mishnah. Bor hakarov la'ama mismale rishon bimne darke shalom. We have a Mishnah that says that the bor, like I just quoted, that the cistern that's closest to the ama, to the water, is mismale rishon because of darke shalom. What does that sound like? That sounds like the guy who's on top, who's closer to the source, based on our Mishnah, he should be able to make the dam and he should be able to get the water first. Targama shmuel liba dirab. So shmuel who says that the guy on top gets first, he would say that's how our Mishnah learns. But shmuel being the nice guy that he is, he says, but I'll try to learn the Mishnah according to you who argues on me. I'll try to learn the Mishnah according to you. Why would the Mishnah over here say that the guy on top, the one that's closer, gets it? And you're holding that in this case where it's flowing downstream, the guy on the bottom gets first. Targum HaShemuel Liba Derav Be'ama HaMisaleches Al Piboro he learns that it's talking about an ama misaleches apibaro. That if it's going naturally, so then the guy on top gets first. But Rav, but Rav will tell you that in terms of the top guy going ahead and putting a dam in, that's where Rav will say it's a problem. Shmuel will say no. The top guy can go ahead and put a dam in because he's learning that this Mishnah means with a dam, the top guy can put a dam in. Rav will say no, that Mishnah's not talking about with a dam, that, that Mishnah's talking about naturally. And therefore, they would go ahead and they would argue when you put in the dam. When you put in a dam, Shmuel would say that's okay. Top guy can put in a dam and take it. Rob would say no. If the top guy can get the water naturally, that's fine. But the top guy has no right to go ahead and put in a dam so that the water would flow to him first. Kamash Malan, again, according to that opinion, that we don't necessarily care within that opinion that the top guy is going ahead and damming it up. Amar Rav Yehuna Bar Tachlifa. Rav Yehuna Bar Tachlifa says, okay, Lemaise, who's the Allah like? When you have a water flowing, I agree, anybody who wants to take the water can take the water. But can the top guy put a dam in or not? What's the Allah? He says, Since we don't know who the Allah is like, call the Alim Gvar. Anybody who wants can grab it, right? This happens sometimes. We have something in the middle. You say, Kol Dalim Gvar. Whoever is stronger gets it. So over here as well, since we don't know who the Lach is like, if the top guy decides to make a dam and steal all the water, Kol Dalim Gvar, he gets the water. Rav Shimi Bar Ashi Otzla Kameh Dabai. So now we have a story related to this. Rav Shimi came before a Rebbe, before Abayi, his Rav. Amalei Losvan Mar Bina. Can we have a Chavrusa, Rebbe? Amalei Isli Inna Ledidi. I have no time to myself. I'm a busy rabbi. When do you want us to have a chavrusa? Ulos van mar belele. So let's learn at night. Amar le'i isli maya la'ashkuye. I got to take care of the fields at night. Amar le'i, so the guy really wants to learn with him. He says, you know what? Anam ashkina le'i lamar maya biyamama. I'll take care of your fields during the day. Ulos van mar belele. And then you'll have time to have a chavrusa with me at night. Amar le'i lechiyu.
Good idea. Perfect. You take care of my fields during the day. I don't have to do them at night. And we will have a chavrusa together at night. Also, Eli. So what did this guy do? So he had a good idea. Now that he was in charge, or Shimi Barashi was in charge of the field, so he said, I have a plan. I'm going to go, and what am I going to do? I'm going to tell the top guys that they can't touch the water because of Misa, they have to let it flow to the bottom. I'm going to tell the bottom guys that the top guys are allowed to go ahead and dam up the river, and in the meantime, I'm going to dam it up for myself. I'll irrigate the fields of Abai, everything will be done, and I'll have plenty of time to learn with him at night. Smart guy. Who said rabbis can't be smart? Amar he went to the top guy. Amalu titi shasu maya beresha. You got to let it flow. Also, let's tell you went to the bottom one. Amalu iloi shasu maya beresha. Let the top guy get first. Adahachi sakar miskarashke. So in the meantime, he went ahead and he made his own dam and he stole all the water for himself. Kiyasa the kamei b'bai. So he went to Abai and said, "Bye." At night, he said, "Oh, you're here so early for the chavrusa." He said, "Yes, I had this great idea. I told everybody that the other one was going to do it. I told them he's going to do it, and therefore I was able to get all the water for myself." Abai is like, "Amale kibetre avaditli." You basically went like neither opinion. You didn't hold like the top guy. You didn't hold like the bottom guy. You didn't hold like Shmuel. You hold like a rav. And what happened? Velo taminu abai lepere dahishata. And Abai would not eat one fruit from his field for the entire year because he felt that Rav Shimi went ahead and did something wrong. Moral of the story is, never have chavrusas with your balabatim. Hanu b'nei be'charmech da'azul karu b'reisha d'shnusa v'adrua v'shidua b'shile nara. So there were these people of be'charmech. I think the article has a nice picture over there where you had a river going down. There's a nice picture on the bottom, no? You have an upper river and a lower river, if I can remember correctly. And what they did is they basically, when you have the upper river all the way down to the lower river, they would make a channel that went like this, and then down, and then back, and then back into the river. So they basically made a channel, so the water's flowing this way. They made a channel over here, and right by the place where they made the channel, they made like a little, they had to put like a little dam like that. So now the water that was going downhill, some of it, half of it would continue going down, but half of it went to the left, went into the channel, their fields were in the middle over here, went here, went here, went here, and then went back. So that water went like this. Instead of beforehand, it was just flowing down, and if you made channels over here, the water wouldn't have gone into your channels. But they made the water here, their fields were on the left side. They went and they made a little piece here, a little dam. So now half the water, they didn't block all the water. Half the water went to their fields, channel, 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 and then back into the river, and the other half just went straight down. But they were stealing half the water for themselves, quote-unquote stealing, not necessarily stealing. Hani b'nei charmech azu karu b'reisha dishnusa. They dug at the top of the river. V'hadrua Vishiduya, and they would bend it, and then it would return, Bishili Nara, as I explained, and then the water would return on the bottom of the river. So the ones on the top, over here where they had made the actual dam, so the ones on top were not getting so much water because all the water was going to their fields. So they said they're causing our fields on the top to not only not get water, but to overflow. Because what's happening? When the water's coming down and hitting the dam here, so yes, the water's going to their fields, but all that water is sort of piling up right by where the dam is, right by where that uh, piece that they made is, and it's overflowing all of our fields on top over here. So Abai said, Amar Luhu, Karu Behadayu Tve You know what you should do? You should dig in the river on top over there. By your fields, you should dig down, make the river deeper, and therefore their dam won't affect the fact that the water won't overflow and you'll have more room on the bottom, and the water will go to the bottom of the river and won't come onto your fields. Amrule Kayav Shepirin. They said the problem is that if we dig deeper, so then, yes, that's fine now, but then when the water starts drying up and we don't have as much water, so now everything, all of the payros, are not going to be high enough to come over to the fields. I mean, right now it's a problem because all of it's overflowing and it's flooding our fields. But if we dig deeper, then when there's not as much water, so now the water's not even going to come out of the river at all and it's not going to irrigate our fields at all. Says Abaye, Amar Lahu, Zilu Saliku Nafshaychu Mehasam. So you know what? He went back to the Bnei Charmich and he says, you know, I have no problem with you making this dam here and taking the water, but the fact that you're affecting other people and you're causing them a loss with the overflow, that you're not allowed to do and you need to close up that dam and not go ahead and um, and not have it there. Let's just do one more piece. It'll take two minutes. So we know that if you have these traps, so if you set up traps in the ocean, so then there's a machlokas in the Mishnah, if you set up the traps in the river, so if it's trapped, if the fish is trapped, so it's either because of dark shalom that somebody can't take it, according to the other opinion, it's literally geza. Once it's trapped, so it actually belongs to you. As Rashi says, if you have actual nets of string or of gemi, so then for sure... Kule Alma, Lo Pligi. 
if you have actual nets that you set up in the river, your own nets, and your nets catch fish, so then for sure, if somebody else would take those fish, that's not that it's that they can't take it because of Dark Eshalom, they can't take it because of Maisa, it's stealing, it belongs to you. So where's the actual Machlokes? Ki pligi bilechi vikukare, says Rashi. They argue when you have no receptacle. When you have a net, so you have a receptacle for the fish to go into. When you just sort of have a, um, as Rashi says, sha'ar mitsudos mechshulim sheno ninchut aruch benar. You put like a long string in the nahar, vechorzen bo mechatis apnei kula. Instead of having a net, what do you do? You put down this long bar and you have like hooks to catch the fish. So since it's not a net and you're not actually collecting something into your net, which in for sure that would be stealing, in this case we're just setting up like a line with like certain type of hooks. If some of the fish happen to get caught on the hooks, so that's where there's going to be a machlokas. Is that now considered to be in your property? And therefore somebody who takes it is actually stealing? Or do we just say, really, it doesn't belong to you, but because of Dark Eshalom, since in fact it's your, it's your rod and it's your hooks, because of Dark Eshalom, we'll give it to you, but really, Mitzad Adin, it doesn't belong to you, as opposed to by the net, everyone holds, not only because of Dark Eshalom, everyone holds that when it's a net, once the fish is in your net, so for sure it belongs to you, and anybody that would take it would in fact be stealing.